Good morning, David. Thank you so much for um, for, for well for agreeing to be interviewed uh, for the uh, for the conference. Um, I thought we'd begin by um, by uh, well my asking me asking you to sort of introduce yourself in whatever way you feel is uh, relevant uh, for this purpose. It's my pleasure talking with you this morning and to be one of the participants at this modern foodway, a China, Chinese foodways conference. I am usually known uh, around the world, except in Taiwan, as David Y. H. Wu. I'm Professor Wu. I call myself professor because I've been teaching uh, and doing research for a while. Uh, almost uh, 60 years and becoming a professor at least 40 years ago at the University of Hawaii. But I must say my uh, people in Taiwan know me as Wu Yang, which is not uh, supposed to be my native Taiwanese language. Yeah, because the uh, so many languages and all that. But very briefly, I've been teaching sort of around the world, mainly University of Hawaii uh, since the 1970s, but I started to work in Taiwan at the top institute of ethnology since I was 18. And then I came to United States to do graduate work. And so I would call myself a Taiwanese diaspora, an anthropologist, a lucky anthropologist for life. Well, this is a fantastic start. Thank you so much. It sounds like you have a, a obviously a very long and rich background um, in anthropology. Um, and I noticed that you also have, a, obviously you have um, um, a qualifications in archeology, span um, but you call, would you say you're an anthropologist obviously first? Um, and how did you um, get into uh, the field of food studies? How, well, how did that transpire? That, I must say, I'm one of the accidental anthropologists. Because, as I already say, you may not have heard anyone who became a professional anthropologist uh, since the age of uh, 1719, because at that time, uh, I was in Taiwan, uh, just fresh from high school because my father uh, was a political prisoner. I had to come out to work to support myself and to support my mother who has to look after seven kids. I'm mm -hmm. one of the eldest. Okay, to make a long story very short, I'm uh, one of the unusual Taiwanese, nice generation is counting from the first uh, immig migrant from mainland China, Fujian. Mm. I'm the nice generation, but I was born in Beijing. Ah, okay. Beijing, China, because my wife, uh, I'm sorry, my, my father, <laughs> who of course was born in Taiwan, and uh, his generation you know, was educated in Japanese, mm. being uh, you know, uh, a colon Japanese colonial subject. I'm sure we can talk about your background. We share a lot of things in, in common. Right? Yeah. And after, in the 1930s, he finished his uh, universities in Tokyo, Japan went to the mother country, uh, China, and got a teaching job in Beijing. Mm -hmm. And so I, I was born in Beijing. And he was lucky enough because of his broad interest in theater, theater early literature in China, and 
he he was a poem, uh, uh, you know, a very productive poem, writing on a Japanese newspaper every day. So the Japanese considered him a leftist, uh, tried to arrest him, so he, he escaped to Beijing. And then my mother, a young girl, who was his Chinese teacher, turned out my mother was the grand child of the first president of the University of Beijing and like my great grandfather, right? And I had no idea until, you know, I was growing up in the, in the state. And so a long story is, this is how Casey Chan, the famed professor who wrote that great book of China's school history, he one day told me, do you know, I first time saw you when you were a baby. Wow. I said, what could, how could that be? I met him first. I was 18 years old, already hired at the Academia Sinica. Hmm. It's like Academy of Science, Institute of Ethnology. As a, a paint photographer, a painter, I draw all the you know, illustrations, plays of the publications for that institute without nobody's teaching. Oh, he and my talent today. Wow, amazing. I am known in Taiwan at least from 30, 40 years ago, one of the only two anthropologists who's a great artist and painter. Fantastic. The first one is my teacher, Professor Chen Qiru, also educated in Japan, but not Taiwanese. It's complicated. And uh, he, he got his PhD in Tokyo University based on one volume, a thick painting of the Aboriginal, Aboriginal clothing. Mm. And uh, well, I became his student in 1958. Yeah, formerly student of anthropology and archaeology at the National Taiwan University. Mm -hmm. And we discovered each other later. He told me, hey, you are the second person I know in Taiwan being professional anthropology, which is also painting. But one thing, how do I begin my research? Not only I work at that uh, Institute of Ethnology, Zhongyang Yanjiu Yuan Minzu Xie Yanjiu Suo, but uh, my the founding father, founding director of the institute, Professor Lin, he was a great musician, a dancer, and all that. Not many people know. And he, I worked there for one year. You know, I thought I wouldn't have money to go to university. I am going to become a professional artist. He said, at least go take the examination and try to enter the Department of Anthropology and Archaeology, the only one in Taiwan, become my student. I was good. I passed the examination means I was ahead of 20,000 young students trying to get into university. Wow. National Taiwan University means you must be the top mm. 1%. It's very elite. I got into anthropology, number one accepted by the department. Hey, wow. A lot of self boasting. <laughs> and uh, I met Zhang Guangzhi first time when I was 18 working in the institute, he came back from Harvard University. His professor Harvard University, mm, mm. he started with his group of PhD students from Harvard, mostly Americans and one Canadian. She started the archeology span mm -hmm. in Taiwan. And then at the dinner, he told the Professor Lin, the director of institute, he said, I want to see 
your young man, there's a Wu Yang too. There, of course, they didn't know. And they later became David. So I went, I said, who are you? He said, I'm Professor Zhang Guangzhu. You know, I my my father and your father were good friends in Beijing. Of course, Zhang was 12 years my elder. He said, when I, uh, when I was young, I first saw you, you were a baby, you were born, you lived next door to our place. Oh, because wow. in Beijing, that's the Taiwanese community. They call it Fujian uh, apartment or something. Okay, that's how I began my research, learn to do research in, uh, in, in, in Taiwan. But I must add one important point. How did I become a food anthropologist? Mm. Since my childhood, since my, I'm, I remember things when I was three years with my parents, we traveled from Beijing to Shanghai to uh, Xizhou and all the different places, Nanjing. I remember all the different food. I was multilingual, say so I was a young kid because my nanny spoke a language different from Beijing from my parents. And then later I was six years old, my father took the whole family to Taiwan, you know, by by the first boat available up to the wall with Japan. I started to notice the lesson. There are so many different languages. We came back to our hometown in Taiwan. The, uh, is is the center of Thai, the island Taiwan. There, the Nanpo, and mm -hmm. there is a famous resort place called Samong Lake. Mm -hmm. That's where my my uh, ancestors settled. I couldn't communicate with my grandma because. She spoke the Taiwan dialect, a kind of Southern Fujian. Mm -hmm. And I could only speak Mandarin. Uh -huh. So after one year, I went to school. Every kid was uh, teasing me, jo joking with me. I didn't know what they were saying. <laughs> they said, hey, they, they, this foreigner, this Chinaman, you know, this, this Chinese. Mm -hmm. We are not Chinese, we Japanese. And anyway, mm. it's already Chinese. Mm. Okay, so with my multilingual and multi, uh, uh, sort of diaspora experience before even coming to the United States, I noticed there are different kinds of food at home. We have Taiwanese ser servants to serve. My grandma's best cook can but speak something I could understand. I help her in order to learn you know, communicate mm. and learn the native language. So all this started about what the lifelong interest in different kinds of food, even with people saying, oh, Chinese, one people, one cuisine. Mm. They are, even within any region, there are several languages, several different kinds of food and cuisine, especially now, it's all global. So, I mean, your, your interest in food then is very long standing. It's a deeply personal um, interest uh, that connected you with your grandmother and others um, in, your, in your background and family. Uh, how did you um, convert that deeply personal interest into um, food scholarship, into something that you wanted to pursue within your academic career? Was it, was it something that you developed um, uh, over time. Um, I noticed that in your bio, you mentioned that if it was from the 90s that you ended up um, exploring this a, a little bit more formally. Um, is that the case? And what, what, what prompted that? Yes, good question. Yes, when I started to work at Academia Sinica, before I had anthropology training, and uh, I was lucky enough, not only the director, at that time, just a handful of uh, anthropologists, they call themselves ethnologists from 
retreated from mainland China after, you know, the communists won the war, established People Republic of China. The, a few scholars, including anthropologists, came to Taiwan. They all were teaching in National Taiwan University or working at Academia Sinica. At the institute, Professor Lee took me in as the assistant. It's just like 19th century anthropology. I became the disciple, and not only that, I had to go to the, uh, the field with, with him in South China, riding on the train where I was his sort of private servant. Okay. <laughs> and uh, I appreciate that. The same is, he snores so loud, <laughs> you know, in, in the sleeping tree, his upper deck, I'm lower deck, I couldn't sleep because of his snow. Once <laughs> arrived in South China, uh, Taiwan, uh, the study, we were going to study the Taiwan tribe mm. in Kingdom, Southern Taiwan. And uh, I watched him, how he did. Then I, I had to help with the, uh, take photos of the, he and his assistant and one young, you know, anthro students of what they do. But after the first time, you know, I was at the institute working for one year. Mm -hmm. And then of course, later, once I was in the university, I became this voluntary teaching assistant to right? for four years following him. And the good thing, one of his early students, Professor, but the late Professor Ren, Ren Xianyu, unfortunately, he passed away last month at the age of 92. Wow. And he took me, he, he told me, now you are our anthropology assistant, right? Go to read some books. Uh, Professor Lin's ethnography. He, Professor Lin was educated in France. Uh, Marcel Mao's mm. student. Wow. If you know the, mm. the, the, the life, life passage, most well known sociologist of oh, 80 years ago. In the 1930s, Professor Lin st uh, studied in Paris with him, came back home to do the first the thorough, great ethno, uh, ethnological fieldwork in north, northeast China, next to Siberia. A tribe at that time called Hezhe, Hezhe or, or Hezhe. Now one of the northern tribe people, one of them is of Ewenki oh, in, okay. in, in north, north China. Mm -hmm. I know. You speak uh, Chinese. You, you must. You, you were a good uh, Chinese student. And then I read this ethnography. Good thing it's translated into Chinese, published also in Chinese. So I know the meaning. His study was concentrated on religion. But then, in addition, Professor Ren, at that time, young research assistant before he came to United States to do graduate work. He gave me a menu, you know, the British uh, uh, notes of queries. Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if you don't know, then you, we should take your PhD back. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Oh, yeah. nice. That's it. your teacher, your teacher's teacher. <laughs> when they went to Africa, they, yeah. they don't uh, follow that. Oh, but what's the next question? So, I must tell you, I was a good student in high school. My English was above average. I, well, sorry, self-boasting. I was good in painting, good in Mandarin. You know, I was one of the best students in Mandarin speaking and my English good. So I could read the notes and queries. I took it to the field. Fantastic. The southern uh, Taiwan 
I started to help the real antibodies to ask questions. Mm-hmm. So I said, what do you call your fa- father's brother? What do you call your mm-hmm. father's mother and you? Mother and that. That's one thing. I said, in the house, I said, what do you call this piece of wall? There's a hole. What do you mm-hmm. call it? Mm-hmm. I did a great job as a sister. I sensed Professor Yen and I became lifetime friend. Oh, yeah. I don't mind to tell you. He is the first thick uh, ethnographic report becoming sort of for a large part of his PhD dissertation was my work. Oh. <laughs> because, because I went you were the... to ask uh, yeah. questions and mm. I I talked to the, the, the grand chief. Okay, Taiwan people is one of best known, the only one had a similar kind of nobility system like the Polynesians, mm-hmm. the kingship system, every, mm-hmm. and wood carvings. Amazing. Wow. Because according to Taiwan's archaeologists, that's including you know, Australian, New Zealand, the Maori archaeologists, they admit their ancestors came from Taiwan. Mm. And uh, the Taiwan people are descendants of one of the original people. So you ask me how I started to study food, agriculture, and pro- production of food. That was important. I followed those inquiries and the other things. Mm. My observation, talking to the chief. I write down all your notes. I started to study food, mm-hmm. food production, everything before I realized that's part of the and as a part of work. Mm-hmm. So with that as the basis, later on, wherever I went to do field work, food mm-hmm. production, and uh, become an important part of my, of my research. Very mm-hmm. quickly still. So, the chief of that tribe and village. By by the way, last year they celebrated 70 years of migrating from mountaintop Taiwan to the village where I started my first real work, 17, 18 years old. And the chief liked me so much, she didn't have a children herself took me in as a grandkid. It's just, just like this, taught me how to make uh, wine. Oh. Have you heard of the kava in uh, Fiji? Oh, y- yes, it's it, a ferment, it, is it ferment? More complicated than that with the tree bark. You know? mm. But what the Taiwan chief taught me was what we could call produce the enzyme is from your, your saliva. saliva. Mm. It chew your cook the millet, the, the rice, and then put, 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 and, and then uh, keep it for a few days and starting fermenting and all that. So when the wine, the millet wine came out, it looks beautiful, tastes good. I wouldn't want to drink it. <laughs> <laughs> no. I don't know how fast it I helped. The, the chief old lady. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> so, and that's my connection with Polynesia. My professor, when I became a professor and became his uh, student at the university, he gave me a direct reading. Go to read the Polynesian, Hawaiian, hmm. Polynesian religion. I started there. Mm. I then I found out even the high god's name are similar. Thank God, I think uh, I, I mean, if I'm 80, I keep forgetting. <laughs> no problem. In, in Hawaii, the, the high god is Takaro, Takaroa or something like that. Mm-hmm. I want people in Tangaroa. Oh, very similar. You can imagine. So, anyway. I read thick book and Polynesia uh, religion by uh, other 
the people can check. Uh, he, 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 this mythologist name, Howley, uh, uh, means a uh, uh, white man. Uh, his name seems to be handy or hand. Mm -hmm. Anyway, 